Hello, I'm Rajesh Bhaskaran from Cornell University. And in this video, I'll go through the pre-analysis for supersonic flow past a wedge, which we will simulate using ANSYS Fluent. Uh, the wedge or half wedge is shown in black here and you have supersonic flow hitting it and you get an oblique shock. And one can predict the Mach number, pressure, temperature, etc., behind the shock using uh, an analytical solution. That is, you can do hand calculations and we will compare the, the fluent simulation results to the hand calculation. And in the problem specification, we are given that the free stream Mach number is Mach 3. So the Mach number over here is Mach 3. And we're also given the pressure and temperature and half the wedge angle is 15 degrees. And through the simulation, we want to determine what is the Mach number, um, especially the Mach number behind the shock, uh, static and total pressure, static and total temperature. Um, and we will uh, verify the results by comparing to hand calculations, but also through measure, adaptive mesh refinement where we'll show you how to refine the mesh just where uh, the, the shock location is. And the whole process is covered in an online tutorial uh, that's available at courses.ansys.com. And if you search for uh, supersonic wedge, uh, you should find the, the module. Um, so in the pre-analysis step, um, I, to, to explain what I'll go through, uh, let me go back to my framework of what's inside the black box, which might be familiar from other modules. Here's a physical problem, supersonic wedge flow. Um, and we're gonna solve it by giving some user inputs to the black box, that is the, the simulation tool. And based on the user inputs, the, um, the fluent solver is gonna determine what's the mathematical model to be solved, the governing equations and boundary conditions, and then it will solve that approximately. Um, so first let's take a look at the mathematical model. So the mathematical model I mentioned are governing equations and boundary conditions. First, we have the continuity equation, conservation of mass for an infinitesimal fluid element. And this is a compressible flow. So you have to use a compressible form of conservation. And I go through the derivation of this in my um, eCornell fluid dynamics certifi certificate program, which you should be able to find through a Google search. Um, and we'll assume 2D flow, so we have two components of velocity, U and V. And let's start listing out the unknown functions. Um, so the unknown functions in uh, this are U of x, y, and I'll leave the x, y out uh, for the others. Um, in the interest of time. So you have V of X, Y, and then you, now density is an unknown. So you have rho of X, Y. Um, so we have one scalar equation, but we have three scalar unknowns. Then we have conservation of momentum for an infinitesimal fluid element. That's F equal to MA applied to the infinitesimal fluid element. And that's the, you know, that uh, equation, um, should look familiar and we will ignore the effect of viscosity. So in the fluent solver, we will set that the flow is inviscid. So there are no viscous terms. And uh, so this equation introduces an additional unknown P as a function of X and Y. And there are two scalar equations, F equal to MA in the X direction and F equal to MA in the Y direction. So at this point, we have three equations, but we have four unknown functions, which means we need to bring in an additional equation, which is conservation of energy for an infinitesimal fluid element. That is first law of thermodynamics um, applied to the infinitesimal fluid element. And this is written in many forms. I will use this particular form here. And since we are uh, ignoring the effect of viscosity, we have to ignore the effect of viscous dissipation and heat conduction. So those terms we throw out, which is an approximation. 
Um, and so we have added one scalar equation, energy is a scalar, but we have also added one additional unknown, which is temperature. So now we have five unknown functions, but we have only four partial differential equations. And we close the equation set by introducing an equation of state and we'll assume ideal gas law. So we'll have P equal to rho RT and that's one algebraic equation. So at this point, we have a total of five equations and five unknown functions and we have a closed equation set. And the, uh, the, the R over here is particular to the gas in which, and uh, air in our case, so which can be written as the universal gas constant divided by the molecular weight. Um, so we will need to give uh, the molecular weight into fluent and also um, in fluent, um, we give CP and CP is, if you remember your thermodynamics, CV plus R. So once we give CP and, uh, and um, you know, an M, it's able to determine R as well as CV. So that's the governing equations. And the assumptions are 2D, steady, inviscid, ideal gas. And then the boundary conditions. This is the domain we will use. Um, and so an external flow, we have to figure out where to put the outer boundaries and you know the shape. So this is what I picked. And um, so this is the wall. And over here, the boundary condition, we can't do the no-slip boundary condition because we, uh, we have inviscid flow. Um, so we have to do a no penetration boundary condition. So the velocity normal to the wall is going to be zero. So that's the, the, the normal to the wall. And this is a symmetry boundary and here the v velocity is going to be zero and also the derivatives in the y direction of all entities are going to be zero. Then we are left with three boundaries. Uh, so we are left with this boundary here and then we are left with, we have this boundary and we have this boundary. And we will uh, set the same boundary conditions for all three, and I'll explain that in a moment. So first, let's look at the boundary where the flow is coming in. Here, we will set the velocity to be the free stream value. So U velocity will be the free stream. V will be zero. Um, and then the pressure will be the free stream pressure and temperature will be the free stream temperature. And we need the temperature boundary condition because we have the, um, the <clears throat> energy equation. And similarly at the top boundary. Now at this boundary, at the back boundary, the flow is going to be going out. And um, it turns out that, you know, the, this, this type of characteristic boundary condition, which is called pressure far field influent, if the flow is supersonic at an outflow boundary location, like over here, the boundary settings are ignored and the values at that boundary will be um, determined by interpolation from the, uh, from extrapolation from the interior. So even, you know, over here, the, say the velocity will match the velocity that we set. Over here, the velocity won't match what we set because it will be uh, overwritten by, you know, values that are ex extrapolated from the interior. So that gives you a sense of the boundary conditions. And so that's my overview of the mathematical model. And I'll do a quick overview of the numerical solution strategy used to solve that mathematical model. And this is again discussed in detail, for instance, in my eCornell certificate program. Um, and you know we'll determine it'll, the the solver will determine selected values of primary unknowns at selected points. So here's an overview of the numerical solution procedure or strategy. 
So we divide the domain into cells and we reduce the problem to determining the primary unknowns only at the cell center. So at each cell center, we, uh, the solver will determine U, V, Rho, P, T. So five values to be determined at each cell center. And it will generate a system of algebraic equations uh, relating those values, relating those cell center values, and that will be done through, um, you know, from the uh, derived from the boundary value problem, the governing equations and boundary conditions. Um, and the details are, you know, discussed elsewhere. And then the solver will iteratively uh, invert the system of algebraic equations and it'll determine U, V, P, Rho, T, these values at the cell centers, and everything else is calculated with the post processing, say, you know, the pressure uh, everywhere, the Mach number, and so on. Okay, so that was a quick overview of the numerical solution. We also did the mathematical model. The final thing I want to do in the pre-analysis is give you a, a quick overview of the hand calculations that you can do. Um, so the analytical approach, this comes from oblique shock theory. What you do is you perform mass momentum and energy balance for one control volume that you uh, select strategically over here. So this is the shock in this figure. This is the velocity in front of the shock. This is the velocity behind the shock. And you have to use the integral form of the conservation equations, which is what is used for the, uh, you know, in the control volume analysis to generate the algebraic equations in the numerical solution. And when you do that, you'll get a jump condition across the shock, uh, which is a local solution, but this is a special case where the local solution applies globally. Uh, so wedge is a special case. And so once we get the jump condition, we can determine the, the conditions behind the shock. Um, so to uh, compare the numerical versus the analytical solution, so the analytical solution, the local analysis that gives us the jump condition across the shock, whereas the numerical solution influent is a global analysis. It'll solve, it'll try to, you know, it'll find the unknowns everywhere in the domain. Both of them use the integral form of the conservation equations, except that in one case, in the analytical approach, you have one control volume. In the numerical approach, you have many control volumes that you mark out through your mesh. A, a big disadvantage of the analytical approach is you cannot generalize easily to large wedge angles or other shapes, whereas the numerical approach, if you have a solver like Fluent, you can generalize the procedure to large wedge angles and other shapes. And, and so using the analytical approach, one can predict the, the Mach number, pressure, etc., behind the shock, and the details of that are in the, uh, the pre-analysis step of the tutorial. Um, so that brings me to the end of pre-analysis. And uh, before I end the video, a quick note about the absolute versus gauge pressure in this particular uh, problem. So absolute pressure is, is measured from absolute zero. And whereas here, you know, in, in fluent, you define a reference pressure and the gauge pressure is, you know, the, um, the difference from the, the reference pressure. So if you add reference pressure to gauge pressure, you'll get the absolute pressure. Now, when you have incompressible flow, you get very small variations in absolute pressure across cells. And to minimize round off errors, you set the reference pressure to be mean flow pressure. So essentially the solver will just calculate deviations from that. Um, so you, are, you avoid small differences of large numbers. Um, whereas in supersonic flow, you get significant variation in absolute pressure across cells, and so there's less concern about round off errors, and you can actually set the reference pressure to zero, and then absolute pressure and gauge pressure are the same, and uh, that's uh, a strategy we will use in this particular um, case. Hope you have a good time simulating this flow.